Uh, my name is Wade Crowfoot, and I um, have the privilege of uh, being secretary here at the Natural Resources Agency. Uh, very excited to have you here today uh, and to uh, explore what is uh, a, a, an elevating priority for the governor and for our agency. Um, let me share first that uh, we are maybe 100 people in this room, and we are likely several hundred more um, watching via live webcast. Uh, and as I understand it, a um, recording of this event will be available on our website afterwards. So if what you're hearing from our speakers uh, and in discussion today uh, is inspiring and you want to spread the word, please feel free to do so uh, by just sharing the link. Um, this is an event in what we call the Secretary Speakers Series. And the concept behind this is to bring leaders and voices from outside of state government uh, into our agency to educate us uh, and uh, inform our work. And so I'm excited that this is about the fourth or fifth uh, event that we've been able to do uh, together. So let me share sort of the frame for today's discussion, and that is uh, how we build access uh, to our parks and open spaces and natural places to all Californians. Um, I would venture a guess that many of us in this room uh, have the benefit of enjoying nature on a regular basis. Uh, I take my five-year-old daughter out to the American River uh, to Paradise Beach uh, once a weekend. Um, the, fact, the fact and the reality is that there are millions of Californians that do not have that opportunity. Um, there are people that live in counties adjacent to the ocean that have never visited the ocean. Um, and while we enjoy, I think, 50 million state park visits, um, I would venture a guess to suggest that well over half of our uh, California residents have never visited a state park and many can't. So while we are excited to continue to, to build our state park system and, and our state natural areas and open spaces, um, we are increasingly focused on ensuring um, more significant access uh, of all Californians to those places. Um, you've heard Governor Newsom talk about a California for all. And I have to say, as somebody who, who um, is lucky enough to interact with him on a regular basis, in public and in private, I think what animates him most is creating a California um, that really benefits all of our residents uh, as it relates to uh, opportunity, healthcare, um, education, and, um, and this access. And so when we take Governor Newsom's priority and think about how we apply it to our agency, it's really um, outdoors for all or parks for all. Uh, I am very excited that just last Friday, the governor announced a budget that includes a proposal of over $60 million uh, in an initiative that we're calling Parks for All. And really, it is, I would call it a down payment um, on the journey we're, we're starting on, which is really how we build uh, access uh, to our state parks. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, I'm excited to learn from four remarkable speakers that we have. Uh, we're going to hear from each uh, for about eight minutes, uh, and then we're going to ask them to come up uh, and talk in panel um, if we're successful. Um, there'll be time to ask questions or share observations and have a little bit of an interactive conversation. And then um, we'll have an opportunity um, towards the end to hear from Lisa Mangit, who's been leading this charge on Parks for All uh, on behalf of uh, the Department of State Parks. So let's first start off with Dr. Nushen Rizdani uh, from uh, the uh, Oakland uh, Children's Hospital uh, and really talking about the benefits of access and what it means. Um, and we'll go from there. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for having me. Um, so I study nature and health, and while indigenous and ancient cultures knew for a long time that nature is good for health, the medical uh, society didn't really wake up to this fact until about the 1980s, when an important paper was published in Science that showed that surgery patients who had a view of nature um, had faster recovery time and less pain medicine use than those with a view of a brick wall. Um, since that time, there's been one other very important paper which looked at the entire population of England and showed that those who live in a greener neighborhood have reduced mortality at every income level and that a lot of that difference was because of cardiovascular disease, which is something that's thought to be related to stress. So since that first paper in the 1980s, over the last 30 to 40 years, 
there has been an explosion of research looking at nature and health. And I'm not even talking about the research on parks and health, um, but they have, we have been able to show an association with health outcomes over the entire lifespan, starting from the prenatal period and how a mother's health is, um, to the birth weight of the child, to things in childhood like whether you wear glasses or are obese, um, to outcomes in adolescence, in mental health, um, in adulthood, and then in the elderly period. There's also a whole bunch of research looking at not just the individual, but family and community health, and the fact that nature promotes social behavior and social cohesion, more opportunities for people across generation to um, have impromptu opportunities to be together, um, decreased crime and community mental health. There have been randomized trials of greening vacant lots that show that mental health increases when you just put a little bit of green in a neighborhood. And this doesn't even include the secondary benefits that happen um, in terms of climate change and, and other outcomes when you green a neighborhood. The way that we think nature improves health is basically through stress relief, physical activity, social contact, and fresh air. I don't think we understand it fully, but these are the mechanisms that we've been um, really drilling into. And nature does also improve environmental stewardship, as you know, um, active care for the environment, a love of nature, and the passage of indigenous and cultural practices, which I would argue are also part of human health and our future as a species. So with all that in mind, with this explosion of research, in 2012, my hospital, which serves um, an indigent population in the East Bay and is a safety net hospital, was approached by our um, park agency, which is East Bay Regional Parks District, and we were asked to write nature prescriptions. And in the beginning, we really pushed back against this because the disparities in access to and use of outdoor areas and nature are basically the same as disparities seen in chronic illness. And so on this slide, um, you'll see up on the upright, upper right corner um, is some work done by Alameda Health County that shows that even a mile difference from where you live in Alameda County can dictate a 10-year difference in, in lifespan. And if you put zip code and race and ethnicity together, that's a 14-year difference in lifespan depending on where you live. Coincidentally, the next map is by Trust for Public Land, and it shows access to parks in the East Bay. If you overlay those maps, they're similar. You have a longer lifespan where you have more access to green. And then the third map is from um, the EnviroScore, which shows toxicity and pollution. And so what you see is the same people who are dealing with multiple health issues are the same people that don't have access to green space, who are the same people who are um, suffering from environmental injustice. And so the thought that a piece of paper from a doctor to go outside would solve the whole problem was quite funny to us as providers. <laughs> this is an, um, just, I just wanted to get into the issue of access a little more. This is an amazing study of the entire United States and the percent vegetation um, and if you look at this picture, the green is actually um, white race. And as you get to higher percent vegetation in a neighborhood, you see how much the percent is of, of white race. And this is independent of income. And so in general, in the United States, census tracts with a higher proportion of racial or ethnic minorities have less green. We ourselves did a study of the United States looking at park access. Um, and out of about 50,000 children, first of all, most kids said that they had access to a park. Um, the Yes Parks, sorry, it's messed up, but is about more than 75% of children have access to a park. Not having access to a park was associated with all kinds of bad health outcomes. Um, but it was interesting because poverty and living in a rural area were associated with not having access to a park, whereas race was not. 
And so these two slides I want to tell you kind of point out, first of all, that nature is not always the same as a park. Because for uh, populations uh, who are minorities, often the parks that they have access to have less green space. And then the second issue is that spatial access or distance to a park is different than social access. And so just because a child has a park near them does not mean that it's a park that they feel comfortable going to or will play in. Um, so with all of that in mind, first we told our park district, that's ridiculous, and why don't you bring nature to us instead of us writing a prescription? And so they, we asked them, they did actually listen, and they decorated the inside of our clinic um, with maps and visuals of nature. And then we said, yes, we, we will bring our patients to nature, but we, we want to actually bring them. And we need transportation, we need food if you want people to be together for three to four hours, and children need to be able to bring their families because this is a behavior that needs to live on in the community um, after this one-time outing. And the amazing thing is that our park district listened to us and they maintained the relationship. And so it's now been five years and more than 75 monthly outings and thousands of uh, children and their families who have gone out into nature for often the first time. And what we did is we addressed the barriers, but we also saw the opportunities and the opportunities that we saw, first of all, were that um, while people did not really want to talk about physical activity or obesity at all, they were quite interested in trauma and stress. And by listening to people, we really de um, developed programming that reflected their needs. We also found that family and kinship and culture were a huge opportunity to engage people in our programming. Um, the next thing that we did was evaluate. And so there is plenty of evidence already and plenty of health outcomes that can be followed. And because we believe that nature is evidence-based, we conducted um, actually the first randomized trial of a park prescription. Um, and what we found is that every time a family went into a park, there was a um, incremental decrease in stress in the parents and improvement in resilience in, in the child. And the, the cool thing, which wasn't that great for our program, but was that it didn't matter if they went with us or on their own with their families. And so while we would love to think that we're central to communities, we're actually just their doctors, and they don't actually need to be with us out in nature, but that means a lot for you. And so what I wanted to do is to flip the script a little. And instead of talking about how parks can partner with health or um, natural resource agency can partner with health, I wanted you to understand that you are a health intervention. Like, this is public health. Having natural spaces and programming in nature is public health. And so because of that, I think the vision should be bigger and you should be dreaming bigger. And rather than only thinking about how do we give people um, a discount on getting into a park, you should be thinking about how do we eradicate health inequity? What is our role in dealing with the mass trauma that's happening in our population right now? Um, and if you think that way, then you need to approach public health departments and hospitals not by saying, can you please come on a panel, even though I'm really happy to be here, but <laughs> can we co-develop a task force that really thinks about how do we improve the health of our communities? Because I really need to break it to you. It's more than through one visit to a park once. Um, but how do we develop programs and measurements that really address the health inequities which are bringing our, our population down. And this, this little circle um, that I'm showing you is from the tons of material that's written in the health department. This is from the California Department of Public Health on how healthcare providers should be engaging with community partners on, on eradicating health inequity. You just need to plug into that as 
really, I think, one of the most important community partners. No one is talking about solutions. Everyone talks about problems. Nature is a solution. <laughs> you have a solution. So um, I think you should think of yourselves as healthcare providers and take yourselves as seriously. Um, and just like our health department did, listen and respond and don't go away after one outing. So, and we've been thinking very systematically about how to get people into nature. And it is, it's the nexus of a lot of things like civil rights, environmental justice, anthropology. It's not simple, but that's okay. Like we can lean into it together and learn about it. Um, and then finally, this is from an outing that I organized with my own community. I'm Iranian American. Last week was probably one of the worst weeks of my life. And this, is, you know, this weekend we went out into nature and we needed it. And so what I wanna ask you is, are you ready for all the traumatized people that are coming to your parks? <laughs> are, like, are, what are you gonna treat us like when we're there? Are you ready? Because you are a public health intervention. You're saying you want parks for all. Have you built capacity? Are you trauma informed? What do you do when you see homeless people? Do you call the police? Are you ready for all the, what's going on in society? Well, this is an invitation for us to work together to deal with these issues and get ready, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zani. <laughs> Powerful presentation. Lots of follow-up questions. Uh, next, we'd ask Catherine Toy uh, to come forward, uh, who serves as Executive Vice President for the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, um, really providing a perspective on what parks can or are doing on this topic. Great. Thank you very much, Secretary Crowfoot. And it's lovely to see all of you here in Sacramento today. Um, again, I'm Catherine Toy from the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Uh, and I'd like to start my talk because I've been at the Parks Conservancy for just over two years, um, but I have been involved with something a little closer to all of you, state parks for more than 20 as part of the work to preserve and interpret the historic US immigration station at Angel Island. So I began my career actually as a history teacher and I used to say to my students, I taught middle schoolers, uh, I used to say to them, everyday people make history every day. And you know, I would get that seventh grade eye roll like, oh my God, that was a teacher thing to say. But I was quite serious in what I was talking to them about because I wanted them to see themselves in history and to see that they have agency, that it wasn't just presidents and generals and dead people who made history, but in fact, themselves and their neighbors and their friends and aunts and uncles who made history in their actions each and every day. And when I think about our parks and public spaces, I think very similarly. So I told you that I was involved with the historic immigration station at Angel Island. Turns out I grew up not 30 miles from Angel Island uh, in a family that had a history tied to that place and I never knew it existed. And you know, as I turned 50 this year, I am getting older, so you could say, well, that was a while ago, but it wasn't really. Um, to say that, that I grew up hearing all about Ellis Island, but nothing about Angel Island, not 30 miles away from where I lived and where my own family had its history. So what does it say when we don't see ourselves in history or we don't see ourselves in public spaces? And I think that's a question that we really need to ask ourselves. So our, our public spaces and public lands are set aside to be preserved and, and enjoyed as civic spaces, places for our, um, you know, that nurture our communities and bring our public together. What happens when community members are missing? So 20 plus years ago when we were doing the visioning for Angel Island um, and we were brought a bunch of historians and park people and funders together to say, what should the immigration station become? And I'll, it, it haunts me still to this day. I remember quite clearly the words of Professor Jack Chen from NYU who said, 
you know, when you, there is a presence of an absence, do you end up with the absence of presence in the larger community? And how does that affect belonging, participation, and power? decision-making, all hallmarks of a democratic society. And so I think when we think about who is in our public spaces and how does that provide people and all of us communally um, with civic agency and action, I think those are really important questions to ask. So everyday people make history every day. And when you see yourselves included in the larger story, you feel you belong. But what does it mean to have belonging in our public spaces? So, you know, recently I attended um, a presentation by Arthur Cohn of Culture Track. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that work, but it's a research organization that has been studying and tracking um, the changing patterns of audience behavior for the last two decades. And it's really fascinating because what they noted was that there was a recent paradigm shift in what people were considering is culture. So like you might be thinking culture and parks. How are those connected? Well, in fact, this in the last culture track study, they decided that instead of defining for people what a cultural activity was, so maybe 20 years ago people were saying, well, it's going to a museum, it's attending the symphony or um, going to the opera. Today, in the last study, they let people sort of self-define what that meant and parks were right up there on the list. So parks as public inst and cultural institutions. And you know what people were looking for in their s defined sort of cultural activities were things that we can deliver in our public lands. So number one list, or thing on the list, was having fun. So in some, you know, in our work, sometimes we take ourselves very seriously and we have to remember that having fun is the number one attraction for anyone to do anything. Um, so, but also people were talking about experiencing new things, about feeling inspired, feeling welcome, about connecting to their communities, and of course, so much about the work that Nusheen just talked to us about, about feeling less stressed and about bettering our own health and well-being. Those are among the top reasons why people engage in cultural activities, parks and otherwise. Um, so, but addressing audiences' stress levels doesn't mean the same thing for every institution or organization. So for some organizations, it can mean how do you create welcome? How do you create hospitality? Or it could mean, do you have enough comfortable places to sit? So, you know, in the parks at Golden Gate, when we've been designing some new park spaces, we've taken a lot of care to go out to the community and to ask people, what do you want and what do you need? And one of the things that came back high on the list was, we need more picnic tables, like big ones, you know? If you're going to have an area for barbecues and multi, they want to bring multi-generational families to visit. So don't just put one little table for six people over there and one for four over there. Make them, you know, someplace where we can really come together with our families and enjoy them. Um, and also content that is accessible. So what, you know, can, it, do we have translation of placards in our state, you know, our historic sites or um, other kinds of materials that people can read in languages that are most familiar to them? So I think on the flip side, it's also important to consider why sort of aspects of culture can drive people away. And it turns out that irrelevance is the number one culprit of why people don't go. It's, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, is it a barrier that people can't get there? Is it a barrier that it's too expensive? Yes, all these things are barriers, but it turns out that the number one barrier is actually irrelevance. People don't see themselves in that action. So, you know, if you say, that activity is not for somebody like me. I don't see myself there. Um, and then the, the second most common reason, apparently, is I just didn't think about it, but which I have to say is also irrelevance, right? It's not something that has come into your mind. And the fact that these um, rate higher uh, than the other sort of logistical barriers that we're all thinking about is really telling. Um, so if relevancy, I think, is the question of the day for about every institution, public, private, nonprofit, 
the uh, governmental these days. And you know, it's about time, I think, for us to think about how do we fix the underlying problems that um, create a lack of relevancy? And what can we do about it? Um, and it's my personal belief that we really have to address these, the issue of relevancy from the inside out of our organizations. So, um, you know, a lot of it, and um, Nasheen referred to this in, in your talk about representation, do people see other people like them in the spaces they visit? So people of color are 82% more likely to s than Caucasian folks to say that a reason for not participating in a cultural activity, including parks, is that they didn't see other people like themselves there. Um, and the need for representation goes to media consumption as well, because people of color are far more likely to say that they heard about something from reading personal blogs or podcasts that are more, or other forms of media that are more dedicated to a specific community than to national um, papers or daily publications. Um, so really, it's up to us in our organizations to do our work from the inside out. I don't think we'll ever deliver authentically on the promise of equity and access for all unless we do this work. And it is messy work. So at the Parks Conservancy, we've been, I think, four years into our DEI work, and we're in the middle of constructing a multi-year DEI plan for the organization. Um, and sometimes it is, and I've talked to lots of other uh, organizations doing this work. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back, or maybe one step forward, two steps back. I mean, this is work that will never really be done if we do it right, because we're always going to be working on it. Um, but it's a, a necessity because representation matters. Building cultural competence isn't a nice to have, it's a must have. Um, and you know, this work is what is going to create relevance, belonging, engagement, personal and civic agency because that's what we have in our democratic and civic spaces and that's what I think is gonna get us there. We must do that work from the inside out. We must create our own workforce and our uh, staff, our volunteer base, all of that has got to reflect or do a better job at reflecting the populations that we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And, oops, we're good. Next, we'll hear from Rue Mapp, who is the founder and CEO of Outdoor Afro. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, we got to do that over. <laughs> I come from a call and response tradition. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. That's what I'm talking about in this enviable afternoon time slot to speak to you. Um, thank you so much. I'm just so thankful uh, to the secretary, um, to the director, and my co-panelists for this beautiful conversation. Um, I'm as much of a participant as you are listening to the wonderful words and experiences that I believe all together tie into together to create a narrative of greater participation and partnership and involvement for all of us. And there's a way for all of us to be a part of this work. Um, I'll share with you my unique perspective that I bring as someone born and raised in Oakland, California, went to all Oakland public schools, went to a public college. I had a very unique upbringing in that I had parents who came from the South in search of the warmth of other sons to California, escaping a Jim Crow South where they had very limited economic and social opportunity. And California represented an oasis of possibility for them. And they brought along with them their love for the outdoors and nature. So even though I grew up in Oakland, California, we had this ranch up near Clear Lake State Park. And it was a place of real refuge for my family to create for themselves a natural environment for me as a child, for people in our community to have celebrations, 
I was able to, you know, see stars at night that I couldn't see otherwise in a light polluted city. Um, I was able to experience wonder along those country roads where I was able to ride my bike and develop a, a seasonally appropriate relationship with my creek that sometimes I could explore safely and sometimes I couldn't. I was able to see the transformation of a tadpole into a frog and, and really have the outdoors be my laboratory. And I say all this because it's not only the underpinning of why Outdoor Afro was started, but it's the part that you all play in my early environmental education that was a lifelong journey that brought me to this moment before you today. And so we have to think about beyond, as you mentioned, the transactional opportunities and the lifetime of engagement with the outdoors that produces leadership. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But in terms of Outdoor Afro, since people ask all the time, how'd you start Outdoor Afro? Um, I had this moment where a mentor asked me a question that I think everyone should ask or be answered, and that is if time and money were not an issue, what would you be doing? And I opened my mouth and my life fell out. <laughs> I said, I'd probably start a website to reconnect African Americans to the outdoors. And it was because of this lifelong engagement with the outdoors, it was because of my uh, connections to digital technology coding when I was just 10 years old in the Bay Area, and also recognizing that I had benefited tremendously from having outdoor experiences, and that over time I continued to grow those experiences into more wilderness areas to learn what I was really made of and how I could really embrace risk. And there were translations in my life that completely enriched my way of life, not only for myself, but for my parents and for my children. And I wanted more people to have those benefits. So Outdoor Afro was actually born in 2009. Dr. Nina was there. Uh, my first presentation uh, at the great, uh, it's Breaking the Color Barrier in the Great American Outdoors with Audrey Peterman, where I talked about the importance of social media to connect with new audiences. Because I realized that starting this blog of Outdoor Afro, that people had a relationship already with nature, but those relationships and those connections were not seen in the backpacker magazines of the world. So when people didn't see themselves, as you heard before, they didn't think they belonged there. And so Outdoor Afro was not only a storytelling blog platform, but it was also about shifting the visual representation of who we imagine gets outside. And that conversation built momentum and people wanted more. And so I went back to social media, asked people if they wanted to join me since I had learned so much in, since forming the Outdoor Afro Network that if they wanted to be Outdoor Afro leaders too, they could. And a baker's dozen of people said yes. And I took them back up to Clear Lake State Park and I trained them and downloaded everything that I learned uh, about connecting with the outdoors. Had some really pivotal uh, experiences with the East Bay Regional Park District. Bethany Facendini is here and who was really instrumental in helping me understand the role of naturalists and, and how they really can be this, this midwife for understanding and connection for nature. And so I wanted to share that potential for other people, everyday men and women, to have that same capacity in their local communities. And then we continued to grow as we learned. And then as we felt more confident, we grew in bigger leaps and kept biggering. <laughs> and <laughs> And uh, here we are in the Marin Headlands, but this is, this is the current roster. We've today trained over 250 men and women to be outdoor Afro leaders. Our current roster is 90 men and women, and they represent a participation network of over 40,000 people in 30 states. And these are just the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. These are not people who came from a traditional environmental education background. And this is important because for us, it is not about whether or not people get outside with Outdoor Afro. It is about helping people to get their nature swagger back. It is about helping to restore outdoor leadership back to the home. That's where I got it. That's where many people in this room got it. And we have to be very careful while we're wanting to be relevant and we're wanting to connect with, with partners and programs that will help us. It's just one step. And as you heard from Dr. Nusheen, it doesn't matter if they come out with us. Um, it may be great the first time so that people know where to park, 
uh, how to pay their fees, how to get there, reducing the barriers of intimidation about how much time it actually takes to fit the outdoors in their busy, impacted lives. And also I have to add that you know, these are people who are not necessarily low income, but they're absolutely undernatured. And these are people who care about parks and public lands, and they vote. But the other thing I have to give voice to is the fact that, you know, while we know that communities have always had a relationship with the outdoors, the outdoors has not always represented, it, represented safety for all people. We can turn to the plaintive ly lyrics of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit that talks about a relationship with trees that's actually the site of terror. And we have a living generational memory who knows about that terror. And so it's important for us to recognize that while you know, we have this opportunity for healing, we have to find atonement and, and space to recognize that the outdoors has not always represented a safe place. But I'm also heartened to you know, remember that we also have people in our families and we also have people in our histories that have used nature as a platform for transformation. I always talk about Harriet Tubman, the original outdoor Afro, <laughs> who absolutely knew the landscape, knew the trees, knew the call of the wild, could read the stars. She did not have a GPS to lead people to freedom in the cover of night. And I'm thankful that Outdoor Afro is here positioned in partnership with many organizations, including many, many trips to California state parks over the years, where we have unearthed the history. We've gone to the Marshall Gold Discovery State Park and learned about the Monroe family and the influence of this African-American family um, in that landscape where you wouldn't imagine there has been a significant African-American presence. We've visited, um, Allensworth several times, a story of triumph of African Americans who persevered to create a town to lift up their best and their brightest in the face of Jim Crow. And so unearthing those histories in addition to the visual representation has been key. And the other thing that we're working on just this year that's I think something we all need to lean into seriously is this inheritance that African American children are drowning at five times the rate of their white counterparts. The reason for this is a history of Jim Crow policies that prohibited people from going to that pool, that beach. And so we have a huge discrepancy of people who do not know how to swim. Now, it's not only life-saving, but it's nature-embracing. You know, we know that and you know, people don't know how to swim, they're not going to want to put a, a pole in a lazy lake. They're not gonna to wanna to get into a kayak, and they certainly are not gonna care about plastic in the ocean. And so Outdoor Afro has set out to give out swimmerships this year, and we set out since April to give out just about 100, and we've exceeded that goal and given 170 babies an opportunity to learn how to swim, and we've extended that opportunity to their caregivers. Again, realizing that we've gotta restore that nature leadership back to the home. And then, you know, just quickly, again, the people that we're talking about in the STEM, this is not only poor African Americans. So often we use this term of low income communities of color in one fell swoop. But I encourage you all to recognize the diversity within the diversity, that we have uh, you know, a broad range of capacities and opportunities for people to be donors, jo join boards, and to really take on leadership positions as it relates to partnerships and other opportunities. And we have this year uh, gone to the Hill two times uh, on Capitol Hill to talk about what is a priority for African Americans and to let them know that African Americans care about laws that protect the environment. And again, it's not just about connection to the outdoors, but really, really connecting with spaces and really hoping that children can develop a relationship with the outdoors. If I see kids outside, for instance, at a beach picking up trash or on a trail doing some kind of trail maintenance, my first question is, have they ever played here? Have they ever had a relationship that they were able to develop in the way that I was able to develop my relationship with my local landscape? 
because it's important that as we're introducing new communities to the outdoors that we're not introducing them for the first time to work. So again, um, we've learned a lot with Outdoor Afro over the years, and I just want to thank you know Resources Legacy and like I see so many people in here. This is like you know a, a room of my people. Um, so I want to thank all the people who in this room I can credit to helping Outdoor Afro be as informed. And I want to continue the momentum of partnership, both thought partnership, programmatic partnership, for us to realize um, you know the the goal that we're I think all headed to. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, like, you know, what does success look like? Well, I think it looks something like, you know, and, and it's a, it is no, you know, cover on a magazine. It's not a ticker tape parade. It's going to be that quiet moment when we'll all look up and we'll see people enjoying the outdoors in proportion to their population and their opportunity. And it's no big deal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rue. And we're, we're, um, we're very fortunate at the state to have uh, Rue Mapp as one of the uh, appointed state parks commissioners. Uh, and she's here along with Phil Ginsburg, who leads the Recreation and Parks Department in San Francisco. And I think, Rue, your point is well taken, which is we could probably have half the room uh, here as panelists. Uh, it really is a remarkable community of leaders that's been driving this movement for some time. Um, let's uh, conclude our speakers with Amy Lethbridge. Welcome, Amy. Don't worry, it's 18-point font. <laughs> so I want to thank Secretary Crowfoot for inviting me to participate today in this important topic and exciting conversation. For a lot of us who have been in this work for a long time, suddenly the momentum is happening, the conversation is happening, 60 plus million dollars in the budget is happening. It's been a long time coming and I'm very, very excited. And I want to thank my fellow panelists for their passion and I sort of feel like I want to just stand up here and say it, what she said and what she said and what she said. Uh, Community Nature Com Connections mission is to increase access to the outdoors for diverse communities through innovative programming in partnership with the communities we serve. Our programming is designed around breaking down the barriers to access found in the research and heard from the communities we serve on what keeps them from visiting public lands. We're in Los Angeles. We do, in fact, primarily work with low-income communities of color, but we also have a staff and board that represents the diversity of Los Angeles. That's important to us. And I do want to give a shout out to one of our board members who's in the audience, Mr. Bruce Saito. <laughs> CNC believes, as do so many of you in the room, that our public lands, our parks, our beaches, our coastline are our treasures. California is defined by many things, but certainly our natural beauty uh, natural areas are part of that. And we appreciate and support the lands that have already been preserved and protected and those that might be acquired in the future. Mark Twain famously said, buy land, they ain't making it anymore. And we know there's biological reasons to save it, wildlife corridors, watershed protection, contribution to climate resiliency. But we also know, as we've heard today, that there are social, developmental, emotional and cognitive benefits of being outdoors in nature and public land is where anyone can go and reap those rewards, right? Well, maybe not everyone. As you've also heard, not everyone has the same opportunity to have experiences in nature. I was an outdoor kid raised by outdoor parents. We hiked every weekend. We, on our limited vacations, we went to the beach or to campgrounds. Uh, we went to parks because they were accessible and affordable, and it was fantastic. And I thought every child had these opportunities, or at least access to them. But in fact, every child does not. So without invitation, they're likely to grow up to be adults who don't as well. This is why multi-generational programming is so important. We heard that several times. We do a lot of work for children. That's fantastic. Research says that if you get to go to a natural area with a meaningful adult before you're 12, you are likely to become a, long, a lifelong user of parks and supporters of conservation issues. But if you don't get it as a kid, then that, go, that travels with you too. So there are significant barriers to public access to public lands for underrepresented populations. The fact is, visitors to our parks do not represent the population as a whole. To be blunt, 
they're whiter, and they're richer. This is changing bit by bit. It's changing because of the good work of the groups uh, that you heard from today and so many of you in this room. Changing because millennials have a really powerful way of recognizing where they're being left out and insisting on their rights. Good on them. Because leaders of the parks and open space movement, many in this room, are recognizing that if you acknowledge the many values and benefits that parks and open space provide us, and you acknowledge the research that has been proven time and time again that those benefits are not equally accessed by all, then, we're, then if we don't address it, we're supporting inequity. We're allowing a system of unequal benefit. You can't have it both ways. This is all the benefits. We know everybody doesn't have access. It's an equity issue. Public parkland is fantastic if you can get there and know how to get there and have transportation and know what to do when you get there and feel, self, feel safe and welcome when you get there. But not everyone does and it's our job to make sure we address these issues. So quickly, my job today was to talk about some of the barriers to access to public lands. You have heard most of them already. I totally forgot I had cool slides for you. <laughs> most of our work is in Los Angeles and most of it takes place either at urban natural areas or in the parks and beaches uh, of the Santa Monica Mountains. So lack of proximity to nature and open space and office, often this goes with lack, lack of transportation. If you can't get there, this is the Los Angeles River. We're doing tremendous programs, as is Friends of the Los Angeles River and other organizations, bringing nature right through the city, through the Los Angeles River. No historic outdoor social or family network. Because outdoor experiences don't just happen. People who have never been hiking or camping or in the out of doors don't just wake up one morning and decide to go. You go with other people. It is a social event. You go with your church. You go with your family. You go with affinity groups. And then you invite others. That's the pattern. So too often we think that if people aren't coming, it's because they don't want to or they aren't interested. And there might be some of that. But I have never had, I've been running a transportation program called Transit to Trails for 30 years. We provide free bus, bus transportation to the parks and beaches of the Santa Monica Mountains to community-based organizations. I have never, ever had a group say, we don't want to go to the beach. <laughs> they may have special concerns and needs to make sure they feel comfortable and safe, but of course they want to go. We already covered this, but am I welcome here? People don't go where they don't feel safe and welcome. And that feeling of safety, that feeling of being welcome, happens in a lot of ways. Lack of representation of a diverse public in the form of park staff and volunteers. We've also already heard about this. If there's no one here that looks like me, then is this place for me? These are very real issues. Another element of this, and we heard a little bit about this, is the lack of representation in the images that promote outdoor use in our spaces. Visitor experience starts when you make the decision to go. It starts when you look at the brochure or the website, right? Assembly member Eduardo Garcia often talks about growing up in the Coachella Valley and hearing of this place called Joshua Tree Nat National Park, which he never visited till he was an adult. Because while proximity was not the issue, the feeling that, oh, I don't think that place is for me, my folks don't go there, was the issue. Lack of knowledge or experience, where, what, how, how much. If you've never been and have no one to take you, how can you be prepared for a safe and positive experience? These are just some of the examples of barriers that come up again and again in the literature. There are more, but I'm gonna stop to make sure I have time for the other thing I was asked to address, which was what can the state do? And you may regret asking me that question. <laughs> but I will say, because I was only given eight minutes, that I also have solutions to all those barriers, so you can see me after the presentation. Uh, so what can the state do? And I'm talking, obviously, about uh, natural resource agencies. And I want to give a shout out to Director Manget and State Parks, who have uh, not only offered a place for all of these exciting programs, but really been a champion for change. Um, but there are other agencies in the Resources Agency, so this, this is for all of you. 
And full disclosure, I am a product of uh, the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, which has received over the last 30 years lots of funding from the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, who I think has been forward thinking in recognizing the importance of these issues. Perhaps that the funding that has been going on for 30 years was more for constituent development than what we now call diversity and inclusion. Nevertheless, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy has funded programs like this for over 30 years. So what can the state do? First and foremost, recognize and acknowledge that this is an equity issue. This is why I so appreciate this forum today. Recognize that equity programming should be core programming, a priority, not last funded first cut. It's not the frosting, it's part of the cake, right? We don't want pilot programs then that we then have to have a bake sale to continue, but an approach to how we do business not separate from acquisition and development and operation, but as a key component. Am I asking for too much? Maybe. <laughs> and that means you have to give your staff the time and the training to do the work and to work with the community. I can't say enough how important it is that there is community involvement, community co-creation in all of this programming. Someone already said communities are not homogenous. There's not a one-size-fits-all. So we have to really work with folks to see how their needs can be met. Otherwise, those barriers will not be addressed. Insist that your state agencies, your state agencies, I guess I'm talking to you, Wade. <laughs> I wrote this late at night. I insist that your state agencies develop and implement equity and access plans to both existing resources and new projects, but this can't be an unfunded mandate. We can't, it's not gonna happen if we just pile it on as new stuff that we don't give money for. If equitable access is valued and considered core to the work, then provide the resources to do it right. And for non-park natural resources agencies, I wanna re remind you that access makes your work relevant, someone just said that, and leads to constituency building, so uh, embrace access in the broadest terms. People might see this as obvious work for the Parks Department, but this is work that every agency needs to embrace. And lastly, as a program provider, this is the one I'm not sure I should say, but it's always frustrating when you're told you can't do something because it's against policy, and then you find out this policy is like 30 years old. Times have changed, policy should change too. Change is hard, big systems and entrenched cultures are hard to turn. I appreciate the work that's been done over the last few years and encourage that they continue. So I wanted to end on this photo of my friend, Park Ranger Viseta Vargas, who happens to be being sworn in by Joe Edmiston, serving in the capacity as Deputy Executive Officer of the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. Excuse me. I wanted to end on this photo because so often programming is seen as a temporary momentary and with no long-term impact and benefit other than a good experience, a great memory in a park. Briseida, when she was 15 years old, joined a junior ranger program at the Biona Wetlands that was funded by the State Coastal Conservancy. This was the first time she had any experience in the natural world and she had many, many first-time campfire, first-time camping, and she was hooked. And so when she was 17, she joined the Naturalist Explorer Program, a small grant through an environmental license plate fund. Then she became an outdoor leader, which is a paid job funded by the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. And three years ago, she looked so young, but three years ago, she was sworn in as a full-up park ranger. Now this, so her journey has been state funded and it's long-term. The investment in Briseida has resulted in a long-term career, but it's not just an investment in Briseida. Every little girl who sees her in uniform, every child from her neighborhood who hears her story, her family and friends that now through her are having an active outdoor life. Future generations, I'm close to Briseida, I want her to have babies. Future generations who now have some of those barriers addressed. All of this started with relatively small investments and a pathway that bridge those state-funded opportunities. This idea that programs don't have long-term benefits and therefore are ineligible for certain funds should be revisited. And no, everyone doesn't become a park ranger. Some go to school and study environmental science. Some just become lifelong park visitors. 
but it's a lifetime experience if you do it right, and we should insist that these programs are done right. It's easy to part point fingers at the Department of Finance. I may have done that in the past. <laughs> but every conservation organization fighting for funding for acquisition and pres preservation should also be fighting for this. Not just lip service to diversity and inclusion, it's not enough. Dollars for acquisition, dollars for parks should also include dollars for equitable access. So the fact that this presentation is happening, that the news that there are specific items in the governor's budget addressing community access and equity, it's like, pinch me. <laughs> New parks with proximity to urban areas, check. New grant program to fund equity programming, check. Parks for all, check, check, check. So thank you to the Newsom administration, to the Parks Department. I will, of course, continue to advocate for more, because that's what I do. <laughs> but I'm also here to say, we're here to support and advocate for all efforts to make sure that the public in public land is real and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's not the icing, it's gotta be the cake. Um, I'll say this, um, I mean, I'm pretty inspired. I, th I, I think there's a, just so much wisdom uh, of the last four speakers, and I think one of my takeaways is, um, as somebody who is just on the beginning of the journey towards being educated around just uh, how deep and broad a concept this is, I think we need to spend a lot more time with you and with others uh, in your leadership positions with folks in our agency just to, to talk about it. Um, so with that being said, I wanna do something. We're gonna lift up the screen uh, if we could. We're gonna ask our panelists as well as our state parks director, Lisa Mangut, to come forward. I mean, to me, we have an embarrassment of riches in the room. It's the bottom of the hour, it's 1.30. We advertised an hour long uh, presentation, but what I wanna do is take 10, 10 extra minutes um, for this panel discussion. So if our panelists can come up with Lisa. If you need to leave, totally understand that. We have meetings to get to. If you can stay, we very much appreciate that. So this is your cue to come up to the, uh, to the seats here, and Lisa as well. Um, the first question I'd have, and then and I might ask a question and, and then um, open it up to the, to the group. Um, Dr. Razani talked about, and it was reinforced by uh, our other panelists, about the difference between spatial access and social access. And, you know, I thought about, you know, I come to this literally as, you know, can people get to the, the park or to the open space? And you talk about that's only part of the barrier. So what would be, you know, one or two suggestions you all have to people who operate either parks or if you're at, natural, or at the Fish and Wildlife Nature Reserves or at fish, uh, Cal Fire Experimental Forests towards providing that social access? A, a few, what's a con anybody can throw out a concrete example of what that what a what a socially accessible park or open space looks like at the state level? Well, if you think one thing that you have to do first um, is about staffing, I do think being able to invest on pathways to get people into the doors, into staff positions at the resource agencies is really critical. It's a long-term endeavor but I think we've got to do it much more robustly and early on. I see a lot of research looking at um, programming and trails and uh, rec centers as draws for people to come. And most of that research is in the physical activity world. Um, but I really, I was very moved by uh, Rue's talk about pre-existing cultural practices in nature, and I think that's an undertapped draw where nothing has to be created because it already exists in communities. Rather, people just kind of have to get out of the way of it happening and um, allow uh, communities to feel that it's acceptable to do their, their outdoor cultural practices. So that might take some listening to communities to learn you know, what people do outdoors in their culture. And I think to um, add to what you just shared, you know, I think sometimes it can be really overwhelming when you're doing outreach and engagement. I think finding those community amplifiers, mm -hmm. I'm talking about pastors of churches, trusted <laughs> teachers, rec center leadership, 
Um, and this is how we position, of course, folks in our organization, but there are, there's community leadership everywhere. And these are your amplifiers. These are the ones that you work with who are gonna be, they may not have all the technical know-how that you have, but they are gonna hold the hospitality piece for you. They're the ones who are gonna say, yeah, this is, this is a trusted individual of a community that says, yeah, this is a great place. I know this park ranger. I know that when you go there, there's gonna be uh, a grill that's big enough for your ribs. <laughs> I mean, and again, you know, it's about building those relationships with the key community amplifiers. But then once people do come, they've got to feel welcomed and they've got to feel like they're doing it the right way and that they're not getting overly enforced uh, for how they may be. I, I, I'm always the group that gets the park ranger visiting my site because we got too many people and we're too loud. Now I can hold my ground because I know who I am and I know these, I, I have capacity to understand these parks and to be able to talk to the park rangers and, and you know, build rapport. But I always think about if it weren't me, mm. how might I feel welcomed? Or how might I feel like I could come back here? So one piece is the amplification of and, and those community connectors. But once people get there, what do you do to help them feel welcomed and understood and supported? In addition, for uh, you know, um, social isolation and loneliness is also a big public health issue right now. And so I think um, it is also of use to have the capacity to hold that and to have staff that understands you know what are the issues that a new mother is dealing with or um, how can you be supportive to a family that's bringing a child to a park you know rather than over enforcing a child and which children are you over enforcing mm. um, so i think we do talk a lot about community but i did want to remember that for some people right now there is a lack of community and they may rely more on park staff for that. Really important point. So Lisa, you've, you've led state parks uh, for several years now. I wanna ask you a candid question, um, which is you know, how far along the journey towards true uh, comprehensive access do you believe you know, state parks is and more broadly the Natural Resources Agency and permission to speak freely? <laughs> Nobody ever actually means that when they say that. <laughs> um, you know, so I guess I would share with kind of a, per a personal um, sentiment about this panel. Um, we did not prep ahead of time or coordinate. Um, I know most of the panelists from prior meetings. I'll tell you, um, I've, I've had a life of being a, in a family of individuals that care about the outdoors. I was one of those very fortunate people that was in, introduced as a young age by my dad. And, and I think I share with you, Rue, that sentiment that I wouldn't be who I am today and have the confidence, the sense of adventure, and all of those things that have made me who I am who I am today, so I'm very grateful for that introduction. Um, but professionally, I've worked in this space for six years now. Um, and I think what I was struck with is in the beginning, it was not that long ago that any one of you here on the panel, or I see many of you out here, whether you're a state parks employee or you're one of the nonprofits or the various advocates out there and the ambassadors for our open spaces, that you probably felt that this was a lonely conversation and that when it was discussed at a budget hearing, you were all alone. And you may, in your respective groups, been the one to like raise your hand and talk about these issues, and you seemed particularly innovative in that group. Um, and so what I'm struck by with each passing year, but particularly this year, that the table's never, I think, been set in the way that it is today. I share all of your enthusiasm about this. Um, to all of you that have been working in this space um, far longer than I have, I think we all owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. Um, you're right, uh, you know, the outdoors needs to be viewed um, as an important tool to advance California's public health initiatives. And so then that's kind of the aspiration. And then what are the barriers to that and how do we tackle that? Um, I agree with you that when, when we design parks or redesign our programming, we need to design the program that reflects how communities want to engage 
with their open space. And part of that belong part of that is a start the start of that is when they come, do they feel warmly embraced and welcomed? And do they see staff that reflect the demographics of California today? Um, so we are doing a lot of work in that space to um, to diversify ourselves. We've created new career paths. We're hiring from outside of the organization. If you're only going to promote from within, you're never going to get there, right? So it's time to be innovative and, and do a lot of different things. And so I guess one of the things I would say is, well, I say that I think the table's never been set in exactly the robust way that it has today, and you've got... Um, we have a governor who's really leaning in, and this is not just lip service. I mean, it is the underpinning of, of how um, he views parks and the administration and Secretary Crowfoot, and I think we've got this alignment that we haven't had in the past, but it's very much a beginning of the conversation. Um, so I think I probably speak for all of the panelists that when we're out talking about this, we don't want to be the only ones, right? And that it really takes... Um, um, ambassador ambassadorship for all of us. And you don't have to have a fancy title. Um, it's pretty amazing just how powerful anybody's voice can be. But um, we've got a, a wonderful opportunity. Lisa, let me ask you a question because Governor made news introducing the budget last Friday. Um, we explained to uh, folks that there's over $60, 000, $60 million of proposed proposed funding uh, for access. What is Parks for All and what should people, I mean, you have a lot of sophisticated leaders in the room. What should people take away from this proposal? I think uh, it's very much the beginning. I mean, for all, for, I'm not going to assume that any of you are budget nerds the way I am. Okay. But if you care He's about a budget parks, nerd. But if you, if you care about parks or these big initiatives and investments, the way, the way the world works and the anthropology of state government is that the governor makes a proposal and it's a really big deal. And you should think of the governor's budget as his largest policy statement. So he puts a stake of ground in the ground, and he is saying that access and parks for all is the cornerstone of his thinking and, and um, his policy thinking when it comes to open space and state parks in particular. And as such, um, we're directed um, as being part of state government is to um, advance these initiatives, and we, we can't do it alone. I think by the fact that you see um, the folks up here on the panel that we haven't been doing it alone, and it's building upon a lot of your important work, you will see me um, sitting up at the table at both the Senate and the Assembly budget hearings, right? Because the legislature is really going to care. And I see some of the faces in here that you always show up at those budget hearings. Um, social media, you're going to see us um, launching and talking about um, a campaign that actually we haven't talked yet to the boss about yet. Uh, but Wade, we're going to be in front of you, and we're going to talk about how we can push out um, and get the word out on the governor's campaign. Um, I will also uh, share with you, I, I don't think that they would mind. Um, the first partner has taken a personal interest. And so um, Wade and I have been engaging with her and her team. And how fortunate is that? And I think that that's great news to share with all of you, um, that we have a first partner that... Um, is really in alignment with all of these comments that you've made, and I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of her um, really advancing these initiatives, so we're really excited. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all your leadership on that. Let's go to the audience uh, for two questions. Yes, and then yes. I'm going to give you the microphone just for the folks on the webcast. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I work at State Parks for seven years now uh, in the Interpret Ed Division, um, very serendipitous route here at State Parks. Enjoyed State Parks without knowing there was a State Parks entity. Um, so it was kind of good um, when I got here to get behind the scenes. When I um, applied for the job, I didn't know what Interpret Ed was, I had to look it up. And um, so now I had this intensive of what it was. But when I listened to the stories that was um, said today, I was getting emotional because um, I grew up in Del Paso Heights, and I remember the intentful purpose that I'm hearing you all speak about, not knowing what it was at the time, when the Boy Scout bus would come into our neighborhood once a month, and all my buddies would run to the bus, and it was all white faces, and they were teaching us how to tie knots and, and what a pelt was and stuff like that, and had no clue what that meant, but it was people that cared. And then the impact through the years of even having a police athletic league and then seeing men in uniforms that we were taught to um, put in a certain perspective, but 
for them to be out there and temporally saying, you know, this is what, who we are. And then being a father um, and watching my son um, partake in, he went to Peru um, for 10 days last summer. And he said they came up and he touched his hair and, and it made him feel different, like a person um, uh, that he was uh, awarded that. He went to a um, historical African-American retreat in Colorado last year, outdoor space and stuff like that. All this stuff to hear you all put in perspective and context um, is just amazing. And I thank you for it. Thank you for your vision and your, your strategies. And it's wonderful. So continue. How can I help? You know, um, so I appreciate it. So sorry for... No. That's about, that's about as powerful as it comes. And thank you for being a part of the, the Parks team. I mean, we, you know, we need more of that passion and in focus. Um, perhaps my remarks are gonna be a little less welcome, but a little bit more pointed because I don't, rec I don't recognize myself or my community either on the pictures or on the talks. I represent the off-road community, the OHV community. There are millions of us in California, and unfortunately, we're the only community that is defined by our vehicles rather than our humanity. And we have been in rooms recently where we have been called murderers and drug dealers. We've been called dinosaurs by other state agencies. I do have to commend, however, Director Mongat and Deputy Director McGurk for being consistently understanding and available. But this attitude towards people who are different has to change. We're all different for very many different reasons. And I'm hoping that this is a state park that is more reflective of all of us. Thanks so much, and for folks, for folks who are not aware, um, OHV stands for Off-Highway Vehicles, and that's folks who enjoy uh, our state parks using motorized vehicles, and whether it's motorcycles or dune buggies. And there are contentious issues uh, within our state parks, and they do really veer into the cultural, as you reference, uh, folks that, um, that utilize that form of recreation, you know, feeling persecuted uh, for being, being criticized for doing that in our parks. Um, we have state laws, statutes that really carve out space uh, for, this, uh, for this form of recreation that is cherished um, among a whole lot of Californians. So I'll just say here that you know, we need to create space for everybody. Um, and part of it is really uh, shaping the dialogue so that you know, we're not vilifying uh, members of the community, uh, be it on their gender, their race, or ethnicity, or the way that they choose to recreate. So I think it's a, I think it's a germane um, uh, point that you make, and thank you so much. Let me turn to our panelists for um, any final words. Um, I just want to say that uh, I think I speak for everybody that's in the room or watching. I'm really thankful for the time that you spend with us, but also, as Lisa said, for paving the way. Um, I think people like Lisa have been at this for several years. I haven't. And so I'll just speak as the person that leads this agency that you know, we'll depend on your wisdom, your leadership, your experience to really chart the path uh, moving forward. And so with that said, um, any final uh, words? I think we've been talking for a long time. <laughs> Not just today, but since I've, you know, started this work. It's time to activate. It's time to be entrepreneurial. It's time to just try. And at the same time, realize that change doesn't happen faster than the speed of relationships. Mm. Well put. Maybe we'll end on that note. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And uh, anybody who works at the agency, just know our next uh, series event next month will be um, a conversation uh, with me talking about our priorities for 2020 and importantly being an opportunity for you as an agency's team member to ask questions of me and our direction. So thank you very much.